Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Data Standard Audio Experience. I'm your host today, Catherine Tao. And today on our show, we have Dr. Maria Wong, an advisor at the Harvard Business Review and additionally some other tech company startups. And today we're going to be speaking about best modeling practices. So I'm so excited to be speaking with you today. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Catherine. Happy to be here. Yeah. And could you just go ahead and introduce yourself and tell the audience more about your background? Yep. As you mentioned, I'm currently an advisor. HPR and some other tech startups. I have been a executive consultant advising companies in various business strategy areas. But I should mention that before that, I have been working in data science, AI technology for years. So even in my today's practice, I heavily leverage data science, AI to really advise my clients, the, you know, the chief business decision makers to make the best decisions, leverage data, data science, and AI technology. So I have a PhD in operations research from Northeastern University and also master's and the bachelor's in uh, engineering fields. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. You have a lot of great experience to really share with our audience today. And right now in the state of technology, data science is the really new hot thing that a lot of different companies are using. The quote that often a lot of people say is that data scientists is the sexiest job of the 21st century because there's so many things that you can do with it. There's so many ways that you can really apply with it. You mentioned that you have um, a PhD currently and you have very high level degrees. And for someone who might not have a PhD right now, but still a aspires to be a data scientist and work in a data science profession and work with modeling, what type of advice do you have for these students when entering the profession? Great question. I got asked a lot about this. So first of all, I want to say that a PhD may not be necessary for all the jobs that are titled as a data scientist. Data scientists nowadays, it can range so widely from type of work like you know business analysis to actually doing coding very hardcore development modeling type of work so we say that there are a few different types of data scientists there are analysts like data scientists there are you know what we call that citizen data scientists people who can do analysis who can also build some models and there are expert data scientists people who really build hardcore machine learning AI models. So the good news is that in today's environment, tools are getting a lot more and easier for different levels of data uh, scientists. So folks who don't have a formal training in data scientists, they can pick up the tools that they may learn fast and that may be uh, useful for the work environment as well. Some framework may require very little coding experience. It really depends on your career path and where you start and how much deeper, further you want to go in this uh, profession. Yeah, no, that's awesome to hear. And so it, it clearly means that it just depends on the role and the end goal of where someone wants to get. If you really need to have the PhD or if a bachelor's or a master's is sufficient enough. Just to go further into the data modeling topic that we wanted to discuss today, can you please give us a, a 101 on data and modeling and just what are some common use models and kind of their similarities and differences from one another? Yeah, not a great question because we hear about models all the time. It sounds so exciting, so sexy, but there can be all kinds of models depending on the application, right? Diagnosing cancer definitely is very different than predicting the user behavior online. So roughly speaking, from technical perspective, you can consider models in the very traditional areas like statistical time series, like building regression models, a statistical analysis to models with nature in probabilistic, you know, probabilistic models, such as, you know, queuing, queuing models, such as Bayesian network. I know they are all really technical or to the some more hardcore, sophisticated models like in machine learning, decision trees, random forests, clustering or deep learning, you know, be it uh, feed forward, the CNN, RNN, you name it. There are all kinds of models. They all have a pros and cons. So when you say model, you want to be clear. First of all, it's parameterized or it's non-parametric. That's really technical stuff. 
Then second of all, consider the business application. Does it require a more high-performing, sophisticated model, a, a more or a more rudimentary analysis model? Yeah, no, that's a great explanation. So it, of course, it also just really depends on the use cases that we're using. And the end goal of what we're trying to achieve with these different models that we're building. So great explanation. Can you tell us more about your passion for just data and modeling, and just where that all started? Was it a specific project you worked on, or what kind of just piqued your interest here? Awesome. After I finished my PhD, that was almost like 15 years ago. And you know, when I was doing my PhD, I was studying mathematical optimization. Basically, it's building really complex algorithm to optimize. Quote unquote, optimize a certain objective. Then I started my first job in Silicon Valley. That was a fintech company doing pricing optimization for banking. I had the privilege of actually working directly with the company founder. And who is a pricing guru in the field, and also an economist. So I was able to really see the large amount of data and dig into sophisticated algorithms and build not only you know customer behavior models but also optimization models and see the application directly. Uh, through building out the fintech applications, so that was when I got the, got really excited about you know building models, different models you know from statistical models to optimization. They can give you very different flavor of how they behave and how they can help in solving the business problems. Sometimes answers can be actually quite、uh, counterintuitive. I'm not going to go into the technical details, but in this use case, for example, when you are lending a loan to a, a potential customer, you would imagine that folks with higher income probably with less price sensitivity. But in reality, oftentimes it's the opposite. There's a long answer to that, but that was something that comes out of a very sophisticated series of model crunching. You know, from behavior model building to the response model building to optimization models. So that was fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. And it's so clear that you're very passionate about this field. And you had also mentioned that you're. Currently working in the industry of just working with different models, and in addition to this, you're also an educator in the data science field right now, and you're working with a lot of students just to teach them the next generation about data science in general. And so there's also a lot of confusion in practitioners with picking the correct type of model, and、um, for the depending on the use case as well. And what is your experience and advice here? Great, it's a very practical question because it's almost like number one consideration. When a data scientist sits by the desk and asked to build a model, so、um, I would say there is quite a bit of experience that you may want to gain、uh, before you say, "Hey, I know everything about how to choose the best model." And in reality,、um, always, always, there is quite a bit of a trial and error as well. But if we just take all the experience together and summarize them. To say, hey, what are the guidelines I can have for selecting models? I can think of a few things. And first of all, you always want to take the business requirement or whatever the use case requirement into consideration, in the sense that what is the performance required? Is it 95% of accuracy that's needed, or it's 60%? It should be should be fine as well, because. With the tool you have, the models or whatever models you selected, performance can be quite different. So that's one. And then obviously you need to take into consideration of what data you have, shape of data in terms of a volume of data, the granularity of data, that how recent the data is, all aspects about data. We know data is the input, garbage in, garbage out. Your different models can require very different quality of data. You need to take that into consideration, and then balance the pros and cons of models. For example, some models need more data, like deep learning models generally need more data than a regression model, and some models are more sensitive to data outliers than. Others. So understand the pros and the cons and the, of the models, 
and link that with the output you need that's going to be helpful. And then you also want to really take into consideration of the interpretability of the model. That is going back to the you know, use case requirement. Some use case, like if you build underwriting model in the insurance banking, the model needs to be completely transparent. You need to design and explain how the model works, meaning what drivers are deciding the model outcome. But in some other use cases, maybe it's not that critical to explain the model's inner mechanism. And then some other practical aspects when you select a model, like your development environment. You know, if you have a huge cloud to work with, then you may consider some heavy lifting models like deep learning and neural nets. Then just working on your laptop, you want to select some lighter models like regression, right? Those practical aspects and what's the programming, what tools you have. Some tools support some better model better than others. And another aspect will be consider the, the model evaluation metrics. That's really important because you eventually you need to evaluate the model for good for bad. If your metrics are off, <laughs> it's not hard to imagine that your models may, may be off. You know, be it R square, chi square, RMSC, whatever, or some application criteria like conversion rate, uplift, whatsoever, you have to use the right metrics to evaluate your model. So a whole bunch of things, but you will get there. Yeah, no, that sounds great to hear. It, it sounds like a lot of just knowing how to apply which model in certain situations and certain use cases when working in the real world and working in industry. I know that you're in between education and industries right now. And a common question that I often get from current data scientists is just the gap right now of students, the curriculum that they're learning at the university level and what they're applying into industry. Have you seen any gap? gaps in things that they should be learning that maybe they're not learning or just any challenges there? Yeah, it's really awesome thoughts. I should mention that in our days, that data science programs in schools online, they already a lot more than to speak of my case when I started 15 years ago. Back then, there was even no such a notion of data science, even though the work we did and uh, things like modeling, they were already quite prevalent in uh, Silicon Valley uh, companies. So first of all, there are still fundamental academic subjects that a, uh, an aspiring data scientist want to take up at school, such as statistics, such as linear algebra, you know, calculus, or if you want to go for more advanced subjects like information theory, like probabilistic models, they can be all super helpful, optimization as well. But there are, as mentioned, that there are more and more data science programs at school, online or in school. Speaking of gaps, um, I would only mention it's the technology. Schools normally, they don't teach you how to use uh, say GCP, Google, that's the Google network, Google platform, or AWS, or other just really cutting edge ML labs in, in, you know, in Azure or whatsoever. Uh, but you can learn that fast, either, you know, either on your own or once you got into the industry. And then real problem solving, not all schools or programs pro, uh, provide that experience. I would encourage you to go on, say, GitHub's, you know, Kaggle, just get a good taste of uh, what real world problem solving with data science is like. So that's basically um, pretty much what you, yeah, what you need and the, the main gaps but the awesome thought. Yeah, absolutely great explanation and great advice to students wanting to go into industry to kind of make that gap smaller with the challenges that they're facing in industry today. Going back to just modeling and what in general, what are some important aspects or considerations that you need to think about when building these complex models? Yeah, I would say that the considerations are highly similar as what we discussed about selecting a model, right? The use case requirement, the performance, accuracy, computational requirements, the model's pros and cons, you know, how it handles linearity and how it handles outlier, such things, and also like interpreter ability, 
how black box or white box models are and how easy it works with your own development environment. So on top of those things, I would remind a hands-on model builder on maybe just one or two. One, just never ever underestimate the importance of data. For one thing, it's data quality. For the second thing, it's the effort that can be needed to just uh, put the data together, cl clean the data, and the process the data, and get that into the shape, into, you know, modeling phase. That's always a quite a bit of, uh, you know, work and not often valued so much across the whole value chain, unfortunately. So that's one. Um, the other one would be if you just uh, jump above all the nitty gritties about building a model, just really take rule of, you know, outcomes razor. If you know what outcome razor means, meaning, yeah, when there is multiple solutions to one problem or to interpret one problem, normally the easiest one is the best. So there can be all different models to solve one problem if the extra performance is not hugely different, then just go for the easiest model. So that's the yeah, that's all the, 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 the goodies I could give you at this point. Yeah, no, I think that's great. I think that's a common kind of perspective that I get from a lot of guests on the, the show as well. It's just choose the simple model as long as it, it works and we can just go with the simple model. It doesn't need to be too complex and complicated. My final question is also just advice to um, experienced practitioners. Do you have any last advice that you'd like to give them or any thoughts? Right. You know, as we and alluded to earlier, this is a field that evolves so fast, not just uh, on the techniques. Actually, techniques, they don't evolve that much or that fast. Machine learning AI started almost like 80 years ago. It is really the technology and other aspects, such as how you interpret a model, especially a sophisticated model. Interpretability is not a uh, solved problem so far. And so, some other aspects, please take into consideration in your career, like human-machine interaction. It's a very vast area, goes beyond just the building models. And data bias, it's more and more prevalent and getting more and more attention these days before we just take the data as a linear input and get what whatever output we want and take that for granted. But now we need to pay a lot more attention to the bias, inherent bias in data to begin with. And other things such as you know, the data science, social impact, I would highly, highly encourage any experienced practitioner to take that into consideration in your professional profession as well. Uh, how AI may impact the society, how data science in general will impact the society and different aspects. AI data science can do a lot. Yeah, no, that's great advice. And I like that you also touched on the, just being more aware of biases in the data that professionals are working with right now. That's often something that's overlooked. And a lot of people believe that you really need to dive deeper into the biases um, when building these different models. So it's great that you're able to, to bring that up as well. And I wanted to say thank you so much, Dr. Maria Wong, for joining us today. At the Data Standard, we're trying to build a community where all data experts can come together to be able to network and collaborate with each other. So what is something that we can help you do? Right. I would love to have folks communicate and discuss together. So especially on the, some key topics that are close to my heart. For example, the social impact of data science or AI, human machine interaction, data biases. So feel free to reach out or follow up. Um, on the different uh, platforms, you know, LinkedIn or Twitter or Medium. I use those sometimes to write different posts. Happy to open to DM as well. Yeah, perfect. And we'll make sure that everybody connects with you on LinkedIn and all of your social media channels. And uh, to our audience, for more information on the Data Standard, you can find us at www.datastandard.io, as well as on our LinkedIn and YouTube channel. Thank you so much for joining us today. It was so great to have you and speak with you and just really learn more about your experiences with data modeling and advice there. And I hope to speak to you again soon. Take care. Thank you, Bye-bye.